The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. All right, excellent. So we are getting started. Thank you to everybody who is spending their afternoon or potentially evening with me as we go over the plantar aponeurosis or the plantar fascia. So we have some great content and information that we're going to be going over. I hope that you find this very uh, engaging. And if you have any questions as we're going through it, just type those in as we're going through so that you do not forget those. And we will make sure that we answer those at the end of the webinar. All of our webinars through EBFA are, they are recorded. They're sitting on both our YouTube channel which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. And then you can also find them on our teachable school, which is EBFA global dot teachable dot com. It is free to join our school and then you get access to all of our free classes and courses, as well as some that are paid, including some new ones that I'm very excited about. We have a new online course, Pelvic balance that is actually going to release by the end of this week. It is one of our live courses. And then we have one that is brand new, totally new. It is a certificate course called the Interoceptive Performance Specialist. What is that? Oh my goodness. So some new courses for you to continue your education. Let's get started in today's topic. As we get started into the webinar for today, I just want to briefly introduce myself for those that may not be familiar with who I am. Uh, so my name is Dr. Splickle. I am a podiatrist. I'm a clinician by trade, human movement specialist, and I take a really strong functional approach with all of my patients. So if you have sometimes a bad taste in your mouth with podiatry, uh, please please don't, or I'm trying, I'm on a mission to try to change that, that podiatrists that are often thought of as pushing patients into orthotics and supportive footwear can actually challenge that and think outside of the box and look at the whole body, functional movement, integrated function, fascia, everything that I know you guys appreciate. And then through that, I built EBFA. This is obviously a webinar through EBFA Global. And then we have various certifications. I wrote the book Barefoot Strong, and I'm the founder and CEO of Naboso. I am quite busy then. Okay. So if you want to follow us on social media, please do so. We do a lot of posts and education through that platform as well. You can see the handles are up on that upper left corner. So we are taking a look at the plantar fascia, also known as your plantar aponeurosis. Plantar fascia is a really fascinating structure. It's an integrated structure in really every aspect of your foot. Your foot is so fascially integrated, and a lot of that fascial integration does come back to your plantar fascia or plantar aponeurosis. So let's go over some key foundational concepts before we jump into some of the pathology and the anatomy. So these key foundational concepts that I want you to think about through this webinar starts with the fact that your plantar fascia allows for dynamic transfer of impact forces. Your plantar fascia is a necessary dynamic structure for energy in and energy out. And this is evident through what's called the windless mechanism. A lot of people have probably heard of the windless mechanism, or maybe you've um, studied it in school or you reference it with your clients or your patients. But let's just go over real quick for those that might not be familiar with this windless mechanism. What I want you to do is to take your hand, right now I have my, my foot is ankle crossed over my knee, and I have my right hand touching my left foot. So if you want to do this at the same time. So I'm feeling my arch and my foot is relaxed. Now, as I palpate the arch, I know my plantar fascia is in there somewhere. Can't really feel it or differentiate it or distinguish it, but I know it's there. Keep your hand on the bottom of your arch and now take your big toe and dorsiflex it back. Now feel the bottom of the foot. Do you feel that tight band of tissue that seemed to pop out as soon as you bent your toe back? Guess what? That is your plantar fascia 
And what is happening is that when you bend your big toe back, because your plantar fascia crosses the MPJ or the joint, when you move the joint, you obviously tighten the fascia. So the, the connection between bending the toe, tightening the fascia, what happens all the way back to the heel is that your plantar fascia inserts and originates on the heel, on the inside of the heel. So it inserts or originates, I apologize, it originates on the medial aspect of your calcaneus. Anything that inserts or originates on the inside aspect of your subtalar joint or your foot is going to be an inverter, okay? So when you bend your big toe back, you tighten your plantar fascia and you invert your subtalar joint. That is technically creating what is called a, I apologize, I have to go back to here, what is called a rigid lever. So that is creating a rigid lever. This rigid lever position of the foot is a extremely important, critical aspect of the foot. And that is linked to your windless mechanism. So bend big toe, tighten fascia, lock subtalar joint to create a rigid lever, therefore is the windless mechanism. And then what happens is that when you take a step and you push off, you essentially recoil the energy that was stored in your plantar fascia. Okay, so understanding that aspect of the plantar fascia and energy transfer is very important to really the integrated function of the foot. So let's go a little bit further. Foot tension equals stability. Now, tension, tension is, is kind of used a lot. You could think I have tension in my traps, right? I have tension in my lower back. Tension can sometimes be associated with a negative connotation, but I really want you to think of it from a positive perspective. Tensegrity, which is referencing fascia, the fascia and the tensegrity web is really a stabilization web. It is a postural web that is triggered by gravity. So sensory, gravity is sensory. That's the way that I look at gravity in, in this the world that we live. Gravity is a sensory stimulus to your fascial system, which creates a tensioning slash tensegrity response that equals stability. Okay, so when you tension your foot or you stiffen your foot through, in this case, let's say the windless mechanism or a transfer to your forefoot, this is associated with medial arch stability. A stable arch is a stable foot. Yes, it is. Okay, and then forefoot stability. So you need to have your lever. So the rigid lever of the foot. What that is, if you if you did a calf raise, right? Even if you're seated, just pretend you're doing a calf raise. All right. Now that position that your foot is in is called a rigid lever. That requires very rapid and integrated stability of your forefoot. And that links to your plantar fascia. So that rigid lever position, which is necessary for power output, is related to that forefoot stability, which is foot tension, which is the plantar fascia. And whew, that is necessary for bipedalism. Now, plantar fascia, just like all the other fascia in your body, is rich in sensory nerves. Your myofascial web, just the whole body globally, myofascial web has over 100 million sensory nerves. So if you have that many sensory nerves, just think of your fascia as one, like an extension of your brain. That's how I like to look at it. But it's also sensory seeking because it has nerves that are continuously regulating the environment to correct and adjust to shifts in your center of gravity or to the ground that you're walking on or to vibration that is entering your body. So this sensory rich tissue is necessary for stability and body awareness, body awareness, or you could say foot awareness, right? Joint awareness, shoulder awareness. You could go joint specific if you want, but it is stabilization and awareness. And your plantar fascia is tied into that as well. And then your plantar fascia is engaged 
slash stressed, active, not only doing dynamic movements such as walking and jumping and running, but also in quiet stance. So when we stand in just one place and we're standing in one place and maybe you're just doing a, a, a static assessment of a client or you're standing for work in one place, your plantar fascia is engaged. It's constantly engaged. And the way that it's engaged or the word that it's called when you stand in one place statically is the reverse windless mechanism, the reverse windless mechanism. So reversed windless, windless we had said was going to be the dorsiflexion of the digits. This is going to be where your toes are pushing down into the ground. So the reverse windless mechanism is going to be how you stabilize on your two feet by anchoring through your digits. Toes pushing down actually creates a lift off of the ball of your foot. So this is huge to understand as a function of your plantar fascia, and it's really a function of your intrinsics, is that you never want to be passive on the ball of your foot, on your met heads. This is especially important if you have a client or a patient that complains about metatarsalgia. Metatarsalgia means you're kind of dropped into the ball of the foot. You're, you're passive in those met heads. That's not what they're designed for. They're not really quoting weight bearing bones like your heel or in, your first met head is more so than two, three and four. So your plantar fascia through the reverse windlass lifts and creates and helps to create the transverse arch of the foot. In someone who has to stand long hours for work, let's say a, a police officer or someone who is working at um, a cashier or I've treated a lot of TSA employees who are on their feet all day, they get the worst plantar fasciitis, and they're so curious of why they get this plantar fasciitis from standing, that is because of the reverse windless mechanism. So we have a windless and we have a reverse windless. So let's take a look at the anatomy of our pelvic, or of our pelvic floor, of our plantar fascia. Oh my goodness, where's Emily's head going? To the plantar fascia. So here we go. So key things with your plantar fascia. One, it originates on the medial plantar calcaneal tubercle. So it's on the inside, underside of your heel bone. Happens to be right where your abductor hallucis originates as well. They originate right in that same area. There's a little bump on your calcaneus. If you have an anatomy model and you look at it, you'll see a bump on the plantar aspect of your calcaneus model. That is exactly where that plantar fascia originates. Now it divides into three bands. You can see on the image here, we have a medial band, we have a central band, we have a lateral band, and then those bands are broken down even further into a superficial and a deep layer. This is going to come into play when we start speaking about plantar fascial tears. So I just want you to appreciate that it splits into bands and then you have superficial and deep fibers. Now your central band is really the band that is the most stressed. When you see a lot of plantar fasciitis, fasciosis, uh, partial tears of the plantar fascia, a lot of that pathology is happening in the central band. It is the central band that divides, extending forward distally towards your toes, and it divides into five slips of tendon. And those tendons become what is called a plantar plate. So the plantar plate is going to be an extension of your plantar fascia that inserts onto the base of the proximal phalanx, and it is the primary stabilizer of your digits. Plantar plate. If you've never heard of it, just think of it as your plantar fascia. It's just the plantar fascia in the digits, and its primary role is to keep your toes in contact with the ground. Go back to the reverse windless mechanism to appreciate that concept. Now, in someone who has torn their plantar plate, 
I, I go into this in our advanced book course that we're doing September 11th and 12th, but in the planter plate, when you start to stress it and you can eventually tear it, this is most common in those with a long second digit, so a Morton's toe, so it's really the most common planter plate that is torn would be the second. It can happen to others, but a little bit more from traumatic reasons. What you will see when someone has a torn planter plate or a stressed planter plate is they start to lose purchase. Their toes start to float. That is one of the most uh, prevalent initial symptoms or clinical findings of someone who has torn their plantar plate is they get a floating toe or they lose purchase. So purchase is necessary for balance and stabilization. You never want to stand with your toes floating. That's not how we balance. Your toes are there for a reason, the digits, right? They help us to balance, stabilize, and take steps or propulse forward. Now, what I want you to appreciate is if you look here, Where's my mouse? If you look here, so this is coming forward. This is the planter plate, if you can see my mouse. And then do you see there's transverse fibers right here, transverse fibers. These are essentially called the deep transverse metatarsal ligament, or essentially it's a ligament that's connecting met head to met head, met head, met head, met head, right? And it's preventing the met heads from splaying or separating away from each other. However, there is a little bit of movement between your met heads. There's actually a necessary amount of movement that we need between met heads every time we take a step. That is referred to as forefoot splay, not toe splay. When you hear people speak about toe splay and minimal shoes and natural foot function, when they say toe splay, they literally mean toe splay, like your toes can spread nice and wide. That's important, but I would argue that just as important, maybe even a little bit more important than toe splay would be forefoot splay because forefoot splay essentially triggers and pulls. So imagine if you were shifting forward to the ball of your foot and your met heads want to pull away from each other. When they do that, they trigger the plantar fascia that's in between, that's the transverse ligament. They trigger it and that triggers a proprioceptive cascade of stability and tension through the foot. If you wear shoes that are too tight and too narrow, you never get forefoot splay or met head splay, which means you never get that trigger for stability or for integrated tension of the foot. And then we start to get these different injuries that present themselves. So that's a very interesting connection that happens. Now, what this is referred to between the met heads and the forefoot splay is called tie bar. The tie bar mechanism what that means is that when you shift forward into a rigid lever, what happens is you're flexing the digits, which is triggering the windlass mechanism to create stability longitudinally in the foot. And then because the fascia connects the met heads transverse, when you go forward and your met heads try to splay against each other, you get this tensional stability that is also in the transverse or horizontally. So you get a horizontal and a uh, longitudinal stability that is the tie bar mechanism. Tie bar means horizontal, longitudinal, connected, stabilizes rigid lever. Whew, that's a mouthful. Okay, so now the last part of this integrated function of your plantar fascia, and I, I don't demonstrate it here because it's actually hard to see um, some of the findings of this, meaning on images on the uh, internet. Really, I need to take take all of you into the cadaver lab and look at the dissection of the subcutaneous tissue. What's happening is that your plantar fascia in the forefoot then splits and it goes into your skin. Now, the reason why your plantar fascia goes into the skin of the bottom of the foot is that the skin in the bottom of your foot is different than the skin on the top of your foot. And just take a look at it and try it, right? The, the way that the skin connects to the top of your foot or the top of the hand, it moves so much 
so much freer. You can kind of pull it and differentiate the skin from the subcutaneous tissue below it. The bottom of the foot and your palm of the hand are not that same way. They can't be that way because we have friction and pressure and stretch and horizontal forces and things that are going through the foot that you need that skin to be tightly adhered to the actual foot structures itself. Think of that's how you're able to do like a pirouette. Imagine doing a pirouette if the bottom skin of your foot was not tightly adhered to the structures inside your foot. You're, you would gather your skin up and, right? You couldn't do a pirouette. There's a functional reason for everything. So now let's go a little bit closer to some of these anatomical structures and divide, discuss them in a little bit more detail. So your plantar fascia myofascially blends into your Achilles tendon. So it's not unusual to have someone who has plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis at the same time. Very common to see that, and that's because they blend into each other. That's your superficial back line. Now, they connect to each other through what is called periosteum. So this blending of the insertion of the plantar fascia to the insertion of the Achilles, that, that fascia saran wrap on your calcaneus bone is called periosteum, and that periosteum can actually get inflamed. So I've had some patients that it wasn't plantar fasciitis, it wasn't Achilles tendonitis, it was actually calcaneal periostitis that I diagnosed them with. And it just was, it's so similar to the other ones. The cause is so similar, but the actual tissue that had the inflammation or the irritation or the stress, and this was on, on, on MRI that it was observed, was calcaneal periostitis. Now, that integration between your plantar fascia and your Achilles tendon, we actually lose that with age. So, and just think of, you know, the more that you're pounding on your heels, just like the patients or individuals who can get fat pad atrophy, you can start to lose some of these fascial connections with age, especially on a weight bearing bone or area of the body. The more that you're pounding your heels on the pavement, you can start to actually lose that connection between your plantar fascia and your Achilles tendon. And this is evident in research as well in cadaver studies. So I had already referenced, I just want to emphasize again, it's another image rendition of it. Please appreciate that your plantar fascia has three bands. Your central band divides into the five slips. It becomes the plantar plate. It becomes the deep transverse metatarsal ligament with a DTML ligament, which is connecting the tie bar mechanism of the foot. Okay. Now let's go into our pathology. Let's go into uh, where things start to kind of go wrong in a sense. Now, heel pain syndrome, plantar fasciitis, but we'll just call it heel pain syndrome to start because we don't know it's plantar fasciitis. When, when you think of a podiatrist or foot pain, the most common foot pain diagnosis that a podiatrist is presented with is going to be heel pain syndrome. Now, this is kind of vague, right? Because heel pain syndrome, what does that mean, right? There's quite a few things that could actually fall under heel pain syndrome, Plantar fasciitis is just one of them. The other differentials of heel pain we are going to go into, we're going to focus primarily on plantar fascia and plantar fasciitis and plantar fasciosis because that's obviously the focus of this lecture. But we can know that there are differentials that if the client or patient isn't responding to your plantar fascial recommendations, maybe they don't have plantar fasciitis and they have something else under heel pain syndrome, okay? Now, what we definitely want to make sure that we don't do as clinicians especially, or even as movement specialists, trainers, coaches, is that if your client says that their heel hurts and they point to kind of the start of where their plantar fascia would be, that you don't just immediately say, ah, you have plantar fasciitis, right? We do want to make sure that we do a full assessment to understand what they are presenting with. Now, let's say if they do have plantar fasciitis, you diagnosed them, or they were diagnosed, and um, you're curious of what that presents with. 
So here we go. Some common characteristics of plantar fasciitis is one, it occurs at the bottom of the foot near the heel. So if you could see where that red dot is here, this, this first red dot, but actually it's like here. So if you actually, if anyone is listening and they have plantar fasciitis and you push right on that spot right there, you can even find it on your yourself, like that spot, that is exactly on the plantar calcaneal medial tubercle. If you push right there on someone with plantar fasciitis, woo, they are going to jump through the roof. That is going to be that classic plantar fascial pain. Now, can you have pain in the middle of your plantar fascia? 100%. Now, when you have it in the middle of the band, this is much less common, but it's important to understand. So the reason why you get pain in the middle of your plantar fascia, in the middle of the band, the central aspect of the central band, let's say, is because you were trying to do something that was dynamic, uh, running, jumping, whatever it is, and you stressed your plantar fascia elasticity to a degree that it didn't have enough uh, stretch or uh, elasticity within the tissue, let's say. And what happened is you got a micro tear in the middle of the fascial band. And what happens when you get a tear or what often happens when you start to stress even micro tear, the middle of the plantar fascial band is you can get what's called a fibroma. And I'm going to mention this at the end again, but a plantar fibroma is different than plantar fasciitis. It might start as plantar fasciitis. And then what happens is you get that first micro tear and then the body has a repair process and it starts to create abnormal accelerated cell growth. This is not a tumor. It's 100% benign. So that's a good thing but it's accelerated abnormal cell growth and it's becoming a mass. So a fibroma is an actual soft tissue mass in the body and it's a result of trauma. And that trauma that I usually see, and again, I know I'm speaking to fitness and movement specialists, the trauma that I often see, this is in the Pilates instructor, the trainer, the coach who's standing on their feet either barefoot or in minimal shoes for long hours, day after day. And they're stressing their plantar fascia via the reverse windless mechanism. And they micro tore it. Maybe it started as a itis. They micro tore it. And now they have a fibroma classic presentation of how I see fibromas in my office. I actually see them in active individuals who are standing statically or are on their feet for long hours every day. Um, so just kind of something to think about. Um, I can totally go into recommended footwear for those who stand long hours uh, so that you offset the risk of plantar fasciitis and fibromas. But here we go. So characteristics of plantar fasciitis, maybe it's at the insertion or the origin of the plantar fascia, maybe it's in the middle of the band, maybe you have a palpable mass, that's fibroma, okay, great. Here, now we have most severe in the morning or after a period of rest. This is called post-static dyskinesia, post-static dyskinesia. That means that post-static, so after I'm static, dyskinesia pain, right? So after I'm laying in bed for eight hours and then I get up, step down, woo, sharp pain when I first step in the morning, classic plantar fasciitis. Or I'm sitting for work and then I get up to go on my lunch break and I step down and woo, stabbing pain in my heel. Now, what happens here is that when you have plantar fasciitis, you start to get micro tearing at the origin of the plantar fascia on the heel bones. You start to get stress. Again, this is because you've lacked elasticity in the tissue. Maybe that's genetically, maybe it's your foot type, maybe it's the activity you did, the volume of stress, we don't know yet. But you're starting to stress the origin of the plantar fascia on the heel, you don't have enough elasticity, so you start to get micro tears. And then those micro tears create inflammation. Yes, there is inflammation in this 
right? There's inflammation and that inflammation and the micro tear starts to get a little sticky. And then the repair process starts to put uh, collagen type three down. So normally your plantar fascia is collagen type one and your body repairs it with collagen type three, which is less elastic or less rubber bandy. So now you have a little bit of stickiness and you have collagen that is less elastic. So just think of uh, the stickiness and the scarring. I'm loosely using scar tissue, scarring down. And then you step down and psh, right, you get that sharp pain. Okay. Now, what people will often say is that, oh, it hurts the first step in the morning, but you know, then I start taking a few steps, I get warmed up, and then my pain will decrease or maybe even go away. That is exactly for that reason, right? You are, it's no longer sticky because you're bringing fluidity, you're bringing the circulation, right? You're warming up the tissue. Okay, now you don't have pain anymore. That is exactly the physiology of why that's happening, okay? Worsens after carrying weight. Yes, of course, because the more weight on your body, the more stress on your plantar fascia. This means that if you are pregnant and you're getting towards the latter part of your pregnancy and you have more weight, could you be susceptible to getting plantar fasciitis? 100% because you weigh more. If you put on weight and you're overweight, will you get or do you have an increased risk for plantar fasciitis? 100% yes, you do. Okay. If you're carrying a rucksack like here, well, yes, maybe that's going to stress your plantar fascia. Okay. Now, along those lines, just as bonus information for everyone, is that extra weight stresses the plantar fascia. This is why in Olympic lifters, for people who are doing true Olympic lifting, competitive Olympic lifting, I actually make orthotics for them because they reach a certain weight in their training that they now would bottom out their plantar fascia. So I give them orthotics when they're at a certain weight to support and to offset the stress of all of that weight that they are pushing through their various lifts. So that that's kind of... Um, ties into this a little bit. Okay. So just some side, side bonus, of course, alleviates with rats because you're not stressing it. Okay. And then, um, you get heel swelling and stiffness. I'd look at more stiffness. Sometimes you can have swelling. I've had some patients with plantar fasciitis and, um, they've actually shown me swelling on the inside of their foot. And that makes sense because in the foot, you have compartments. So you have compartments in the foot and these compartments um, are like pockets of tissue, the pockets of muscle. But if you start to get inflammation in these pockets or these compartments, can you actually see that is visible swelling on the medial aspect of the foot? 100%. Okay. So let's take a look at the acute versus chronic plantar fascial pain. Now, if you had someone who had heel pain insertional, they matched everything that was on the other slide and they had it for two weeks, six weeks, maybe a couple months, they're still sitting within the acute diagnosis, the acute plantar fasciitis. As soon as someone has plantar fascial pain or a diagnosis of plantar fascial pain for longer than six months, it now becomes chronic. I'm using quotes here, chronic. And that is now considered more of a fasciosis and more degenerative in nature. Now there's a bunch of gray in between this, but those are some general guidelines as far as when someone has plantar fascial pain and they're wondering what to do and how long should they do it for and how long until they feel pain relief. All of that has to do with how long have they felt the symptoms for? Have you ever had these symptoms before in your life? If someone says, well, I've only had this for like a month and you're like, oh, it's acute. But you didn't ask them that had they had this before. And they said, you know what? I have suffered with plantar fascial pain for the last 10 years. And then it'll go up and down and up and down. Maybe I'll see the podiatrist. Maybe I won't. And I haven't had pain for three months, but whew, this last month, I've been having plantar fascial pain. That's not acute. That is a chronic plantar fasciosis. They probably have marked degeneration because they had 10 years of stressing their plantar fascia and cyclical micro tear, inflammation, collagen type three, healing process, that whole cycle 
that that would be a classic plantar fascial presentation that is setting themselves up for eventually tearing the plantar fascia. So when we have some of this difference, I want you to appreciate, look at this normal plantar fascia. Do you see it? This is under the, the MRI. Do you see the thickness? And then compare it here, this abnormally thickened plantar fascia. So you can start to see some marked thickening. When tissue is thick, that does not mean it is strong. This goes to your plantar fascia. This goes to your Achilles tendon, whatever tissue in the body that it is. Thicker does not mean stronger. That means that there's degeneration. When someone has a large Achilles tendon, let's say even on one side, and you're like, why is that right Achilles tendon so much bigger than the left? That means that they have probably had repeated micro tear, stress, Achilles tendonitis, uh, calf strains, et cetera, et cetera. And they are setting themselves up for potentially getting an Achilles tendon rupture. Here, when you start to get that thick of plantar fascia from a chronic nature, you are setting yourself up for a plantar fascial tear. Remember, degenerated tissue or thick tissue is degenerated tissue and degenerated tissue is weak tissue weak tissue. Okay. So let's say you do have someone, you have a client, you have a family member, right? This is my mom right now, right? So you have someone who has had pain in the heel, right on the plantar medial tubercle. They're like, yes, yes. It's right there. X marks the spot. When I push right there, Ooh, I see stars. Okay. Now this is what you want to recommend for them. And remember that 90% of people will respond to conservative treatment. You want them to reduce their activity. Now, let's say if they are runners and or they teach step class or um, grant it's a little bit hard if they stand for work, but let's say whatever the stress is that they're placing on their foot, whether it's their job, their activity, their sport, you really need to modify, reduce, or maybe even take like two weeks off of what that is, right? So let's say it's a runner. I would say, okay, for two weeks, two weeks, I need you not to run because every time you run, you're stressing your plantar fascia. So we're essentially taking one step forward and half a step back. So in order to actually get some progress and to get you past this, I need you to pull back just for two weeks. Not a problem. You'll be fine. Okay. Then the other one, I'm sure that there's going to be some controversy here, but it, it is the protocol. Or it fits into the protocol. This is, there's tons of research articles around that, but this is the standard conservative treatment for plantar fasciitis. Okay. Again, some of them you can go for, you don't have to go for, but these are they are. What I recommend for my patients is if I had someone coming in and they have an eight out of 10 plantar fasciitis diagnosis, and they've had it for two months or maybe let's say even three months. So now it's getting like really annoying, right? Three months and they are having a hard time, you know, working. And let's say they're a teacher and, you know, they're just at their wits end and they just like, ah, we need to get better. Okay. Stop running. You have to stand for work, but stop running. I need you to get out of um, out of something that's going to stress your foot. I need you then to either take NSAIDs, something anti-inflammatory, ice your foot at the end of the day, take NSAIDs for two weeks, every single day for two weeks. Now, if you are going to take NSAIDs, the way that you want to take them is that you have a constant blood level in your system, which means you cannot take a leave only when you feel the pain or once a day and then skip a day, even though it's indicated for every 12 hours, you literally have to do this around the clock. I do it for two weeks, 10 days as the shortest, but I typically do it for, for two weeks. And I often prescribe what's called Mobic, which is a one pill once a day, anti-inflammatory, easy on the stomach. You take it for two weeks because everything that I give for plantar fasciitis is done around two week protocols. So for two weeks, you're not running, sorry. For two weeks, you are taking Mobic, one pill, once a day, every day. And then I want you to ice your foot. You can freeze a water bottle, foot, put your foot on the ice if you want, roll around. Okay, great. 
Okay. I need you to myofascially release your calves. So you're going to go proximal, which means above. And then I need you to go distal or past the plantar fascial insertion. So you're going to be around the ball of the foot. The forefoot is what I'm going to have you release. You're going to release distal and proximal to the site of pain. And you're going to do that 10 minutes every day. Great. You're not going to do stretching right now because you're sitting at an eight out of 10. I can't, I'm not going to have you stretch when you're that high of pain level. Okay. And then I'm going to have you do the myofascial releasing, doing the ice, you're taking the anti-inflammatory. And then I may, I may have you go into an over-the-counter insole or arch support. I like power steps. Hear me out for those who think I'm only barefoot. So hear me out. Power steps for two weeks. Okay. If you don't want to do the power steps, there's something that's called an elastic arch strap, an elastic arch strap. And I put that on the foot and it just gives it a little bit of compression for these two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. Patient comes back, client comes back. I'm just having you, of course, some of you might not be diagnosing this, but I want you to understand the protocol that I go through for this. Then they come back in two weeks. If they do not have any improvement and they've only had this for three months, I'm not thinking plantar fascial tear yet. They've never had this before in their life. So I'm not going to order an MRI yet because they should be responding to this. Okay. I may strongly suggest a steroid injection. Now, the reason why I suggest a steroid injection or cortisone, same thing, the cortisone or the steroid injection is because the longer that they sit with this inflammation around their plantar fascia, it's been three months already, inflammation and micro tearing and collagen type three, and they're sitting, that in itself is causing weakening of the tissue and degeneration, starting this degeneration cycle that I want to prevent. So by me doing a steroid injection or a cortisone, I am helping them to get, get rid of the inflammation. Let's knock it out, drop it down so you can continue the rest of the healing process. Okay. That is again, based on if I don't do that and they continue to persist, now they've had it for six months and we have a different animal here. Okay, so I would suggest the steroid injection. And then the bottom here, how it says night splint. I would add a night splint now after this two weeks. And again, some patients, the patients or the individuals that get the classic first step in the morning pain, well, that's the 10 out of 10, they respond well to night splints. Um, those that do not have it at the end, Ooh, those that do not have it at the end um, often do not respond like that. My goodness. Um, uh, do not respond like that to the night splint. Okay. Now, if they, hear me out, I'm almost done. If they do the, they had the eight out of 10 and then they did the two week protocol. Maybe they even came back in two weeks and then we did a steroid injection and then they come back in two weeks and now they're, down like a two out of 10. Okay. Now we can start doing foot strengthening. Okay. Now we can start doing foot strengthening. Okay. Once they start to go down, we don't want to be doing short foot and foot strengthening when someone is at an eight out of 10 plantar fascial pain, because you're just not going to get the um, response. And uh, someone has said that they're surprised about the steroid injection, but this is where you, this is clinical experience versus just across the board, steroids are, you know, the worst thing in the world. Don't ever, ever, ever do a steroid. No, it depends. It honestly depends. And my decision of using the steroid is based off of exactly what I said. If we try to go through a much slower process of you healing this without it, and we could have just kind of knocked this out with one steroid, just one, that's it, then your tissue health might actually be better. Um, so that's, again, it's a clinical decision and that's after treating hundreds and hundreds of plantar fascial patients and seeing how they respond to the protocol. This is my protocol, okay? Great, so now let's say they've had plantar fasciitis, osis, for over six months, maybe a year, they're frustrated, what do I do, right? If someone is not responding to conservative plantar fascial recommendations, then, 
then you want to delve a little bit deeper. What is going on here? Let's say they've had it for a year. Maybe they've had one injection. They've been doing physical therapy. They're strengthening their feet. They said, oh, I'm doing everything that my trainer says to strengthen my core and strengthen my glutes. And it's just not working. And I still have this pain. My mind is starting to think that we have to look to see that they might have degeneration of the plantar fascia, this scar tissue, this stasis, this thickening, and they're setting themselves up for a plantar fascial tear. They might even have a plantar fascial tear. I'm going to order an MRI as for sure my step one. Let's say the MRI says, oh, you have degeneration. No tear, but degeneration. This is where you can start looking at some of these other treatments. If you've ever heard of um, shock wave therapy, ESWT, um, essentially what it's doing is it is re-traumatizing the tissue. A true shock wave therapy, you have to numb the foot because that shit hurts, right? You have to numb the foot. And then there's a device that essentially pounds and pounds and pounds into the tissue, creating micro trauma. It's essentially re-injuring the tissue to then re-kick it into a quote unquote acute state. This is done with other modalities as well. You can, what we used to do like old school ways, you can go into the OR and you essentially just kind of poke a bunch of holes into the fascia and just trigger it. You want the blood flow to get to the tissue. Um, now there's something that's called uh, topaz, which is essentially doing that same thing. You're burning, burning radio frequency into the plantar fascia to trigger that same um, acute response. Now, let's say if they had a plantar fascial tear, a partial tear, which I'll go into a little bit more later, but a partial tear of the plantar fascia. This is where in my office I do stem cells and the stem cells is designed to repair the tear or the individual may go for a plantar fascial release. The plantar fascial release is essentially going in and cutting, cleaning up the tear and you cut through the medial band, two thirds of the central band and you leave one third of the central band and the lateral band in intact. Now, you can look at research and they'll show that there's no decrease in function, that you get, you know, the arch and the foot isn't just going to suddenly drop down and collapse. But what you will see, and there is some research supporting it, is that you lose a little bit of the integrated tension of the foot, that tie bar mechanism that you lose after a plantar fascial release. And, but again, you have to weigh your risks and your benefits, right? If someone is in just stupid pain and they're compensating and stressing other areas of the body, I've actually recommended to patients to get the plantar fascial release because we need to just get them better and move on with their, with their life versus continuing to stress other parts of the body and having a poor, um, poor quality of life. Now, let's say that they're not responding to the conservative treatment. Of course, we recommended the, the conservative ones, but you do want to start thinking if one of your clients or, or patients isn't responding to your standard protocol, you're strengthening the feet, maybe you've got them into minimal shoes. I have, I get emails from this all the time of clients who went minimal and started strengthening their foot, doing short foot. They're working with their trainer to strengthen their feet, core glutes, and they still have this plantar fasciitis that they just can't get rid of. Then I start saying, maybe that's not even plantar fasciitis in the first place. And for that reason, we need to then have some differentials, send them to someone else, have them get a second opinion as far as what potentially is causing that heel pain. So this is where we go back to heel pain syndrome. What's going on? right? So this is where the plantar fascial tear. So you can see this is an image to the right of the plantar fascial tear. This is primarily what I see in my office. So this is a majority of my um, patient base is non-responding chronic connective tissue diagnoses. Um, so I do primarily stem cells for patients. Now this individual has um, plantar fascial tear. Remember I had said that a majority of the stress in the plantar fascia goes to the central band. So I see primarily central band partial tears. And the way that it is going to happen is that it'll be either the superficial layers or the deep layers. So it'll be actually read and demonstrated that superficial fibers of the central band partially torn or deep fibers. 
Now, the way that you can think about this is as if you had a rope and the rope was fraying, but then the frayed ends of the rope were staying next to each other. So that's an opportunity for scar tissue and stickiness to happen. And yes, they've had a tear, but now they have this whole bundle of star scar tissue that's happening within the area. And wherever there's scar tissue like that, you lose the elasticity of the fibers. So they start to micro tear what was previously micro torn and then you get into this cascade okay now the plantar fascial tears this is you really have two options you have the stem cells or you have the plantar fascial release or technically you could not do anything and you could just immobilize for a period and if you immobilize for a period then um the area will reduce in pain, but as soon as you start to stress it again, you will then have symptoms. So just immobilization for stressing of the plantar fascia is not going to be the best option. You really want to address the tear itself. Couple last ones, and then I know that we're coming towards the end where we'll ask some questions that you guys might have. So Baxter's nerve entrapment, this is another one. So Baxter's nerve, think of this like, um, it's not exactly like carpal tunnel, but kind of like that, okay? So Baxter's nerve is a nerve branch off of your tibial nerve, which innervates the bottom of the foot, and then you have your lateral plantar nerve, and it's a branch off off of that nerve and it innervates the abductor digiti quinti. And that, that nerve branch goes right underneath your plantar fascia so it can get sticky or adhered underneath the plantar fascia. The symptoms are really, really similar to plantar fasciitis. So this is where if you ordered an MRI, it would show up on MRI that you have nerve entrapment is what a lot of them would read, or some of them will read atrophy or denervation of abductor digiti quinti. And then from that, you can deduct like, okay, the nerve that innervates that muscle is happening to not get there. So there's atrophy of that muscle. Why is there atrophy? Okay, that nerve, now I have to look. And it's a Baxter's nerve entrapment. The treatment for this is going to be much more steroids. So someone had mentioned that they're surprised that I would actually recommend a steroid injection. For something like this, for an entrapped nerve, the steroid injection, in my opinion, is almost necessary because outside of that, you're looking at doing a dissection, like a nerve dissection. Um, and in any patients that have, um, if you can see my arrow here, if the nerve gets sticky up here, you can actually do a hydro dissection. So you do it essentially under water. It's ultrasound and water, and the water spreads the soft tissue and the fascial tissue away from the nerve. Um, it's a way to go in and not use a sharp dissection. So these are a few other key differentials that we have when it comes to heel pain slash plantar fasciitis is, is it a stress fracture? Is it a fracture fracture? Is it calcaneal periostitis, which I've referenced earlier? That's the saran wrap that surrounds the heel. Is it tarsal tunnel syndrome? Your tarsal tunnel is right here where this purple nerve is coming down right across here. There's a retinaculum, which is a band of fascia that sits here and essentially it compresses the nerve. That is tarsal tunnel syndrome, just like carpal tunnel syndrome. You see that oftentimes in more pronated or flat feet that are stretching the nerve through there, or it might be a plantar fibroma, which I'd referenced earlier. The plantar fibroma is a benign mass of scar tissue that sits within the middle of the plantar fascial band, not, not just the central band, but the middle of the band, middle of the arch. And a lot of those, I will do steroid injections into those to try to weaken them. So this is, again, another use for steroids that is clinical application is you're trying to weaken the fibroma so that it it shrinks itself. Um, otherwise, you're looking at a surgical excision of the fibroma. Okay. Now, as we wrap up, I know we are going close to our time. I have just a couple more slides and then we'll go over any questions. And then those individuals that cannot stay on, um, this is recorded, so absolutely no worries at all. So here's a few key misconceptions that I see around plantar fasciitis and the 
kind of movement industry, let's say. So one is the heel spur. I have a heel spur, therefore that's what's causing my pain. That is the biggest baloney <laughs> that is out there around heel pain syndrome. The heel spur does not do anything. It does not cause your pain. It is a direct response to tension on your fascia. That is called Wolf's Law. So when you put tension on tissue, on bone, and you pull bone, the bone responds by laying down more bone. That's Wolf's Law. That's how we create heel spurs. It sits within the fibers of the plantar fascia and is not poking anything or causing pain. This is plantar heel spurs. Posterior heel spurs in your Achilles tendon, those are a little bit different, okay? So if anyone says you have a heel spur, if your podiatrist says you have a heel spur, therefore go see another, another podiatrist, get a second opinion. Another misconception is around the use of orthotics or arch support in plantar fasciitis. I will actually use these acutely or transiently, temporarily, to just bring some support to the foot so that I can get the patient out of a 10 out of 10 pain scale. That is the purpose of it. Then we can go into strengthening the foot. If they have an overpronated flat foot, you may want to seriously look, in, look at this, knowing that it is not the forever answer. It is more, I need to get you into a little bit more controlled state so that we can get you moving forward, but I cannot do that if you are in pain, okay? So I do use orthotics in this way and uh, if you say, well, no, this is so anti-barefoot, then put your Naboso insole on top of that, okay? And then finally, uh, this has to do with the steroids, that yes, there's a misconception that steroids are bad, 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 but they do have their role, understand their role. I've had steroid injections myself because I've had severe, severe shoulder pain. And I knew that the alternative was going to be a slow burn of a recovery process, or I can do a injection so that I stop compensating and getting this transfer stress. So it's always a matter of uh, risk versus benefit, weighing out your options and appreciating the transfer stress. Um, if you do do the steroid injections, you never do more than three injections to the same area in the same kind of narrow period of time. So you would actually space them out. So you could do theoretically a couple within a month or two and the patient would be fine, or the individual would be fine, okay? And then finally that we want to just strengthen your feet and your plantar fasciitis will go away. Not always, not always. Sometimes, yes, if we get someone with plantar fasciitis to a lower grade, like a one, two, three, and that's where they're sitting or they come to you and you're their, their trainer or coach and they have low grade plantar fascial pain and it's just kind of talking to them, you 100% can strengthen their feet. Please remember that short foot, which engages your flexors and intrinsics, essentially stresses your plantar fascia as well. So you want to be very mindful of the duration and the intensity at which you engage short foot because you really can set off someone's plantar fascial pain by doing short foot. Keep it around 20 to 25% max contraction for that individual with plantar fasciitis so that you do not trigger it in a bigger way. Okay, great. So if you guys have any questions, please type those in, type those in. And then I want to extend an invitation to a foot and ankle intensive workshop. We're doing this virtually via Zoom on September 11th, 12th. You can find the registration on ebfafitness.com. It is only $100. That is for the virtual class only. And it is recorded if you are curious. Yes, if you cannot attend all of it, it is from 10 to 5 and then 7 to something. It's, it's essentially seven hours both days at various times so that people across the um, country and really world can tune in based off of their time. If you cannot attend one of these dates, we have our online course, which is sitting on the EBFA Teachable platform. Excellent. I will let you guys type in your questions. And I'm just going to look to see if there's any questions that came up on the other video. 
Okay, so someone had asked why add insoles at all? Uh, so that I hope that I explained that I use orthotic slash insoles in someone who has uh, uh, low grade plantar fasciitis and, or sorry, has plantar fasciitis and I'm trying to get them to be low grade. I'm trying to get them to drop down into something that I can uh, then start to strengthen their foot in a better way. Great. And let's see. Doo, doo, doo. I will wait just one more second if anyone has any questions. I know sometimes it takes a minute to, to respond. Now, as you're as you're thinking of some questions, uh, and if you don't recall the questions, then um, you can always email me. I'm gonna type in my email right now, education at ebfafitness.com. That is, if you want this PowerPoint, you will get the recording as well. And if you have a question that you think of or a client or someone that you're working with that has plantar fasciitis that's not responding and you don't know what to do, maybe they were suggested, um, you know, only steroid injection and only physical therapy, right? And you want something that's outside or you're suspicious that they might have a plantar fascial tear or something like that, then please reach out and I can definitely guide you um, in that process for those, for those patients. But the, the fascial integration of the foot is fascinatingly uh, intricate and you know, just the, the, the tie bar mechanism and how the met heads connect to each other and how you need uh, met splay or forefoot splay is really important. You know, restrictive shoes that are compressing the foot and don't allow that splay cause a lot of, lot of issues. Yes, it constricts the toes, but I want you to think of both the forefoot splay and the toe splay. Both of them are equally important. Okay. If there are no questions, then I want to thank you guys for your time. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope that I see some of you or actually all of you on the Advanced Foot and Ankle Intensive September 11th and 12th. Just head to EBFA Fitness or if you can't find it, email me and I will hand you to where you would need to sign up for that. And I will hopefully see you guys on another free EBFA webinar. Have an amazing day or night.